So probably one of the, the trickiest ideas in all of rotation is this one, this idea of a moment of inertia. In translational moment, motion, what makes an object hard to move, to resist changes in its motion? It's a concept called inertia and its mass, period, end of story. A large object is going to be easier to accelerate than one with less mass. Okay, no big deal, right? Big, if something's big, it's harder to move. Cool. All right. When you're rotating objects, there's a whole nother thing in play. And if you watch the bit on torque, it's basically the same idea. If you have, let's see, I'm trying to think of, of an object that's like this. I guess a, a baseball bat would work. So let's consider a baseball bat. It's got a skinny little end. Right? And we're going to look at a pretty extreme one. In fact, we'll look at a baseball bat that's essentially a club. How about that? So, something like this. Right? So you have, looks like a paddle, but you get the idea. We're looking at like a, a baseball bat with like a heavy, really heavy end and a really light end. Alright. So, depending on how you, where you grab this thing and try to rotate it, it can be easy or difficult to, to get it to spin. I mean, if you grab here, if you make this your axis, and you picture yourself with this with this baseball bat in your hand, right? Or picture yourself with um, mm, all right. So I paused and I'm back and I figured, you know what? You guys need to experience this. This is just like being in my class. We're here on Corona break, and you know you don't get to you don't get to see me stop in the middle of teaching and then wander around my room to make something. So. I got a hot glue gun. Seems to be working. Yep, got a hot glue here and everything. I got a steel ball. I found one in the apartment. That's pretty rare. But hey, put some hot glue in that little hole. Stick this in there. Bam. Give it a second to dry. All right. Just making sure things stay put. So here's the object in question. It's basically a, a club, right? A little club. Okay, so this thing has a certain mass. If I wanted to just accelerate it across, I push it like that, then the only thing that matters is the mass. But if I want to spin it, it depends on where my axis is. For example, if I want to use this end as where I want to at my axis, then spinning it this way is, is harder, right? This is not an easy thing to do, right? particularly if I do it vertically. But what if I want my axis to be down here, where all this mass is? Spinning it now, piece of cake, Ooh, any way I want, doo, doo, doo. look at that, that's easy, right? You can imagine yourself doing this. Spinning it this way, easy. Spinning it this way, more difficult. You get the same effect with a baseball bat. If you grab it by the barrel, it's easier to move it around. If you grab it by the handle, it's harder to move it around. Well, then you may be like, well, why the hell would I, why would I do that then? Well, because once you do get the baseball bat started, it's harder to stop, isn't it? See, inertia works both ways. So if something's moving, it, and it's harder to stop it. So when the ball hits it, it doesn't affect, right? doesn't affect the motion of the bat as much and you get more power out of it. You get to you get to hit the ball farther. When baseball players want to make sure they make contact, they choke up. So they they bring their radiate their axis in even closer and that way they it's their inertia for their their rotational inertia for their bat becomes less and then they can make adjustments as the ball is coming to make sure that they make contact. So the idea here is is this object has really an infinite number of rotational inertias. We could spin it at one of the ends. We could spin it here, right? Spin it here. We could spin it kind of close to this end. We could spin it kind of close to this end. We could spin it through an axis right down through the middle there, right? Like so. You can even put an axis that's kind of skewed through it, but there's an infinite number of places you could put an axis. Each one would have its own value for i. 
it would involve the mass of the total mass of this thing. But where, the, just like torque, where the axis is makes a difference. So, for a single, so let's imagine that the weight of this pencil, the mass of this pencil is virtually zero compared to the ball. Then we can treat the ball like a single point mass, like a, a single object. And if we rotate it from this end, then the equation we would use to find, remember we're ignoring this bar part at all, completely. Kind of like if we were swinging this thing, uh, this ball on a string, all right? Then for that situation, for a single mass, axis out here, something really ridiculously light connecting it. This could also be like, um, like a planet going around Right? Gravity making the Earth go around the Sun. Right? The rotational inertia for that object, I, is the mass of the object times the distance from the axis, from the center of the object to the axis, call that R, squared. Squared. So the distance for rotational inertia really makes a difference. The only equation I believe that shows up in your equation sheet is this one. But every object through calculus, every you can find basically starting with this principle and something called integration, you can find the rotational inertia for any object in any arrangement. For example, if I rotate this poker chip through the center there, it has there's a formula for that. If I rotate it through an axis that passes this way, through it this way, like this. There's a rotational a formula for that. For a sphere, there's a rotational formula for going just through the center of the sphere. There's even one if you wanted to rotate it like kind of on, on an edge. There's all kinds of them. If you're in an exam situation, they're going to give you the formula. This is the one that they will give you, expect you to know. They'll give it on the equation sheet. But if there's a different um, formula, if they have you working with a disk or something, they will give you that formula. Um, they don't expect you to memorize them all or be able to derive them. In general, keep in mind, the farther away mass is from the axis, the more, the harder it is to speed up or slow down if it already is spinning, the bigger the I value. So for example, um, if you have a solid ball of mass M, or you have a one that's hollow, but with the same mass, so you can cram all the mass to a thick, so maybe this is like um, a ball made of wood, and this is one made of, of a metal. They're the same mass, but here all the, all the mass is out here. This will have a bigger eye than this one, even though they have the same mass. Why? Because the assuming the axis is through the center here in each one more the mass here more the mass is located farther away see here there's some mass that's really close but here it's all located pretty far away and so there are all kinds of equations for these um i should really have a few handy with me right here but i i don't um but look them up equations for moment of inertia in fact I believe Khan Academy on their video has a sampling of them. Um, but in general, objects that are hollow are harder to spin than objects that are solid. So bicycle wheels, I, my last uh, example of rotational inertia. Bicycle wheels, your typical 10 speed wheel has all of the mass. Oh, this is ugly. Hold on. We can't be in that. Oh, jeez. I have a circle here. Why not use it? So, so your typical 10 speed wheel has all of the mass located pretty much on the outside. As much of the mass as it can. It does this by having a light, hopefully a lightweight arrangement in here and then spokes that connect it, which are very lightweight. So that way, most of the mass is far away. Well, if you're sitting, it gives it a large I value, and you're like, well, but that makes it hard to speed up. Yes, 
But once you get it up to speed, think of what a 10 speed bike is made to do. It's meant to just maintain that speed. So once you get it up to speed, it's hard to slow down. And so coasting becomes a lot easier because this thing doesn't want to give up its energy to friction very easily. It's hard to slow down because it has a large I value. So it makes sense. There is an Olympic sport, you may not be aware of it, where they do bicycling on an indoor tiny little track. Like, tiny little track. It's really curved and it's really banked. And so the bicyclists are constantly accelerating. And there's more than one of them. So they're, they have, they're slowing down, they're speeding up, they're turning real quickly. They need to be able to change their... What's more important for them is they need to be able to have a change this rotational speed of their wheel very quickly. They want a wheel with a small value of I. So if you ever look that up, indoor bicycle racing, their bicycle wheels are made of a solid material, a plastic or something, all the way through. With probably has pretty much uniform mass all the way through so that much of the mass is located close and that makes their wheel have a lower eye and in their sport where speeding up and slowing down is more important than coasting that helps so there's just a couple of examples but you will want to look up equations for you know moment of inertia but the fundamental idea is right here I, the fundamental idea is the mass and then how, where is that mass located in respect to the axis? And the farther away it is, notice it's squared, the, the harder it is to move something, all right? To get something, not just move it, to get it to spin, okay? That's I. 